So I suspect that you've found some strange allies in this space because I, here I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I qualify as a strange ally. May, maybe, possibly. Uh -huh. uh, but but basically, you're you're a lefty, right? You're you can, yes. do you consider yourself progressive, or if you had to describe your your political views? I call myself throughout the book a leftist feminist. I mean, I wanted to make it clear that uh, you know I wanted to make that clear. Yeah. Yeah. I have not shifted right. Okay, so, well, first off, what does a leftist feminist mean to you? I guess let's define that and then we'll... Yeah, on. I mean, I, at one point, I suppose, in, in my career, I would have called myself a Marxist feminist. So, I mean, it means, for me, uh, you know, I believe in redistribution, and I believe in a sort of feminism. I mean, I guess I was steeped on what would have been called Marxist feminism or materialist feminism that um, took... And also, but that had a kind of emancipatory direction. I mean, and I'm also somebody very interested in psychoanalysis, so I use psychoanalysis a lot. So, I mean, it's a bit of a motley collection of influences. But by left, I mean, I mean that I think the economic level is um, something that I want to factor in, um, issues about class. I, I got, uh, I wrote a book about pornography a long time ago that, uh, I got interested in the subject because I'd written about Hustler magazine and that uh, my point was that the feminist anti-pornography movement had not taken class into consideration at all and that Hustler was not just about gender, it was also about class and a sort of attack on elites. So I'm kind of trying to factor those uh, levels into the sort of, uh, you know, thinking that I do. Yeah, so I'm curious, so as a leftist feminist then, potentially, or a formerly Marxist feminist. I haven't heard that one before, but all right, there we go. Um, do you find that your allies right now are coming from quarters that don't quite make sense to you? Yes, the, the situation, I mean, I should just say the situation on campus makes no sense in terms of uh, who, what groups think of themselves as on the left. And I'm sort of dubious about whether uh, a lot of the activism is what I would call left-wing, even though you know the right loves to hammer the the, the left-leaning students. But I mean, the student student activists are more and more acting like authoritarians, and you weirdly have the conservatives and libertarians acting like liberals and you know promoting free speech. And, and that sort of thing. So I mean, this is this is now you're telling me yeah, my life story. Yeah, basically. yeah. Well, yeah. it's become it's become my life story too. And trying to myself make sense of this political moment, and yes, finding myself getting a lot of invites from places like you know various libertarian and conservative leaning foundations that I do you know would not really have had much uh, to say to previously. Yeah. How does that? feel for you, you know, like when you're getting invited to these things that previously you either would have had major political disagreements. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing, especially if they're libertarian groups, they're never telling you what you can say or anything like that. And I yeah. suspect you probably wouldn't go to a place that, yeah. that would anyway. But that you have these new allies um, must be ki kind of weird for you. I mean, I know what this feeling is, so that's why I'm curious yeah, about it. Yeah, it, it is. And um, I mean, so there's an area that we overlap, uh, we're in agreement about, um, but you know, I think it is more the economic issues. I mean, like I did an interview with Reason Magazine with Nick Gillespie, who, mm -hmm. you know, is a really smart, interesting yeah. guy, uh, knows a lot of social theory, but you know, I suppose if we started talking about more economic issues, you know, I'm not somebody who wants to let the poor people starve, mm -hmm. you know, so we're, uh, I think that's probably where I depart. You know, yes, we agree on free speech. We're probably less in agreement about, um, you know, regulation, uh, that sort of thing. I don't know that they want to let the poor people start, but they just don't want to sorry, the government involved in that. But that, that's, a, that's a whole other topic. But I just think it's interesting yeah. because as someone with those beliefs, which I fully respect, I think you're finding the allies that I've found lately. Is, is anyone on the left? Defending you, I mean, is there has been has there been any outreach of leftist professors or anything? Um, there's, I think there's some. Well, the people that should support. be your intellectual <laughs> allies, right? The people that agree with you on yeah. everything that you write about and yeah. talk about and teach about, are they offering you any shelter? That, that's I guess. What well, I get is. a lot of supportive email from people saying I would be afraid to say what you're saying in public. So I know that there's a, a, like an underground layer of support. And yeah. I mean, I think that it's generational. Some of the sort of um, older generation of leftists, somebody like Todd Gitlin, who is you know an SDS person who teaches at Columbia, has written also about um, the free speech issues on on campus. 
So there's certain people out there, but it's, no, it's been a little, I'm not going to say lonely, but uh, I feel somewhat on my own in trying to make sense of this situation and, you know, doing a better or worse job of it. Do you think it's possible that you're, what should be your allies, especially in the public space, I was mentioning to you before in the green room that I see all these celebrities and comedians that when DeVos did this stuff and, and rescinded these uh, Obama era uh, additions, that basically they were all tweeting about how DeVos and Trump are pro-rape and they hate women and all these. Mm -hmm. Now these are, these are leftists who you probably agree with on all, on all the economic stuff, all the social stuff, all of that stuff, but they're doing you actually an incredible disservice is what I would say. And I, I looped you in on one tweet when Chelsea Handler tweeted something about this and I said, yeah. I'd love to have you on. Uh, come on with Laura. And I and said, no, talk. I would shoot myself. Right, but, <laughs> but think about that. I mean, that's, that's actually kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. I would guess that if you and, and Chelsea sat down about most political issues, you would agree on most things. But then sh they tweet these kind of crazy over the top things and then they're actually undercutting what their academic allies should be doing. I think it's a really fascinating little piece of this. I have a sort of allergy to self-righteousness, and um, you know, I mentioned having written about Hustler magazine, and I suppose it's what drew me to somebody like Larry Flynn as an interesting figure. You know, mm -hmm. I was kind of interested to sort of weave through the over-the-top outrageous stuff he said, and to try to make sense of some of the politics behind what he was saying. And this sort of instant position taking that people like that are engaged in, I mean, you're talking about Chelsea Handler, um, you know, I, I'm not somebody who ever really wanted to be a pundit. I wanted to sit and think about some of these issues and think about the contradictions and the complications, and that's what I've tried to do in, in, in my writing. And I think there's, well, this maybe sound, sounds self-congratulatory, I think there's too little of that, and it may have something to do with Twitter mm -hmm. and, you know, the, um, you know, sort of instantaneous opinion forming that is required of people who are on Twitter. But I don't think it's interesting. And so um, I guess I kind of veered toward the people who are saying things that complicate the situation as opposed to simplify it. Yeah, well, that's why we're here doing this so that we can get some of that across, yeah. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about your book. Um, okay. What's the exact quote that you have on the front of the book? I have it here somewhere, but it's it's pretty perfect about feminism. Uh, if this feminism hijacked by melodrama, how, yeah, uh, uh, is how feminism hijacked if by melodrama. Femini if this is feminism, is feminism hijacked yeah. by melodrama? That's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's good that you know that. That was a, that was a very on the spot question, but you are correct. Um, so what what is happening to feminism? Mm -hmm. There, there. I see from my audience and just from so many people that I respect in the public space right now, just an abject rejection of modern feminism. These are not people who dislike women. These are people who want equality of opportunity. Uh, these are people who date and sometimes are women in the first place. So I don't think it's about hating women in any way, but that modern feminism has just been morphed into something sort of crazy. How's that for an opening? Mm -hmm. for <laughs> it's, it's a broad question. So that, that wasn't a pun. Um, <laughs> that was good, that was good. It's a bit hard to answer that. Um, you know, here's where my Freudian side kicks in. I mean, I, I feel that in the current situation or in relation to these questions about sexual assault or what's going on in campus in terms of sexual politics, I do feel that there's been too little self-scrutiny on the part of women who regard themselves as feminists um, as opposed to the scrutiny of like male sexuality, male aggressivity. And it was one of the things, and this is probably one of the more controversial sections of the book where I tried to write about how much drunken sex, binge drinking, you know, con uh, conditioned sex there is on campus and how much, you know, women are reluctant to analyze their own participation in these situations or our own conflicts about sexuality. So, you know, that's something where, again, I was kind of trying to complicate the situation as opposed to just say, men are predators, you know, male sexuality is aggressive and bad and women are these sort of violated innocents. So I feel like there's just too little, I, I'm maybe not saying this incredibly well, but, you know, as I say, like too little introspection about um, our own 
sexual uh, sort of participation. Right, so even though to write about that or talk about that, I know that there's gonna be a certain amount of people who will say, well, you're victim blaming. Yeah. That they're already yeah. gonna put the onus yeah. on you, even though you're just, yeah. you're really talking about personal accountability. To some degree, yeah. I mean, you, you know, if somebody's, uh, using force against you, that's not a situation where one needs to talk about personal accountability, sure. but in terms of drinking and the kind of complicities that uh, arise in, in those situations, um, and the ways that I think, you know, I'm a teacher, and I think universities should be in the business of educating students and helping them figure out how to be more autonomous, how to be more self-examining, as opposed to this layer of regulation that um, you know is, has taken the place of, of education. So that's what I'd like to see more of, um, you know. And I think self-examination, honest discussions about what happens in these sexual situations and alcohol-fueled situations. So you know, I'm kind of pragmatic about it. Yeah, I mean, speaking of pragmatic, how much do you think just social media in general has affected this whole conversation? Because I would imagine that a lot of times some of these cases are brought up because the next day when, when they wake up hungover and everything, they suddenly realize there's five pictures of them doing crazy mm -hmm. things. You know what I mean? Drinking yeah. and a funnel in their mouth and taking bong hits or whatever they're doing. And I think back to my college days, I mean, I did pretty much everything you could think of. The idea that now everyone's walking around with cameras doing all these things, it just, it's almost like they're creating like a hostage situation, but they're the guards and the hostages at the yeah. same time. Yeah, I think that's really true. And it's something, I spent a long time, I spent about a year trying to have conversations with my own students about this issue of sexual assault and what what was really happening. And I found out a lot of distressing things. I mean, particularly distressing if you've been a feminist for quite some time and think by this point in the evolution of human history, women should not have such a hard time saying no or knowing what they want in these in these situations. And you know, I found out I think that a lot of the drinking has to do with, particularly on the part of women, not really knowing what they want. Um, and so drinking themselves blotto so as not to actually have to decide in situations, you know, yes or no. Do you think that's more uniquely uh, a female trait in, in, for uh, colleges? Because I can see that be. for guys too. I, um, it, it may be. You know, I had an interesting conversation with Susie Bright, the sex activist, who said that she works with college students a lot, who many, most of whom have never had sex sober and are appalled at the thought that you would even try <laughs> to do that. <laughs> But what it's I'm, a ridiculous thing to do sober, I think. <laughs> Probably, as an academic, it would, see, can, it would yeah. actually uh, seem. But what I was gonna say about the social media part, so I, I in talking with students, um, and I had a conversation with a class, one of my classes once where I, and I repeat this in the book, where um, somebody said something like, I, they, were, they were moralizing about a movie that I'd shown and about the sexual choices one of the characters had made. And uh, their moralizing, you know, just seemed, uh, I wanted to sort of puncture it a bit. So I said something like, you know, when I was in school, we all thought about, uh, we talked about liberation and, you know, sex is pleasurable. You guys seem to think about sex as just simply a harm and a potentially dis destructive thing. And I feel kind of sorry for you. And one of the students said, well, yeah, sex can kill you. So I started thinking that well, this was this generation that was the first post-AIDS, post-HIV generation, and they've all had this, you know, god-awful forms of sex education where the destructive, harmful sides of sex have been emphasized to them. But I talked to the student who said this, he'd graduated and we had an email conversation, and what he said was, what I meant was social death, that social wow. media, like everybody knows what you did the night before, and you can be sort of killed publicly mm -hmm. because of these, these choices that you've made. So I do think there's something about them feeling like they're in a kind of fishbowl uh, that, that does change the, the tenor or the sense of the experience of it, and and I think the, you know, the af the regrets in uh, the aftermath, or the f feeling that, you know, many months later, well, wait, I didn't actually consent to that. Uh, I think social media does have something to do with, uh, the the way these the ways these situations are construed later as harmful, where in the you know present in the moment that they happened 
you know, it was just a sense of confusion. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So basically it's a compounding of really poor sex education in general, or, or just attaching a certain amount of fear which may at one time have been justified, and then you add the social media, now you've yeah. really got like this, this toxic mess there. Yeah, and the other thing is that I think there are just a lot of messages on campus aimed at women. I mean, everywhere you go, the conversation is about assault. So I think there's an, I mean, almost a kind of uh, encouragement to frame experiences as having been assaultive or non-consensual after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that all seems very consistent with something that I see on the left lately that we've talked a lot about here, that the left, at least right now, seems to really value victimhood. They think that victimhood is virtue. So it sort of makes sense. You, you can't talk about sexuality in a way that's empowering. You have to talk about it in a way that creates a victim situation for you because then you have sort of authority to talk about it. Do you, do you think that that's a fair? I would step back from that a little bit and say that you know, I, I think the attention to social justice on campus is a valuable thing. So I, you know, I do want to say there have been people, I mean, there, you know, who are, who are marginalized, who are victimized, whose identities have been, um, have subjected them to various forms of, of, of violence. So the, um, I, I dislike the language of victimization, you know, getting as, as broad as that. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there is a way that those positions, the, you know, and it comes under the rubric of identity politics, let's say, you know, the, the identities that have been, have been marginalized, I mean, do uh, attract a lot of attention, you know, both in the curriculum and not in the curriculum to some degree to rectify, you know, the sort of, you know, errors of history in the past. But, you know, so that does play into uh, all of these things sort of, I think, converge around this notion of sexual victimization at the moment, including, you know, then this this layer that comes down from the, did come down from the federal government in the form of Title IX. Yeah, so how do you unfurl all that? I mean, how do you, as a feminist, take the power back now? Do, do you see a movement growing on there? I, I haven't really seen it. I, I hope it's there. Well, I do hope that, you know, if this doesn't sound grandiose, that the book that I wrote will have some effect. And, you know, what I was able to do was um, I got access to two Title IX reports about this professor. And, I, I mean, I was in receipt of a lot of other actual Title IX reports from people who sent me, both professors and students, who sent me the, the, the documents from their cases. So I went through um, using all the critical skills that I've developed in my many years as a leftist feminist um, and did a you know, kind of close analysis of the sort of decisions that the Title IX officers were making in this case. And I talked about how capricious the, the judgments were, how gender biased, you know, how steeped in stereotypes about male and female sexuality they were. So, you know, that's something that there hasn't been an opportunity to do, to look at how these judgments are being made and, um, and, and to contest them. Because as, you know, I've said all of this has happened in, in behind closed doors, there's been no oversight, no daylight, no transparency. So I think more transparency on the, this process. And I also think transparency or discussion about sex on campus and particularly heterosexual relations generally, that needs to happen. Yeah. But well, basically you're saying if you were a young professor these days, you probably wouldn't want to teach in the California system oh, no. knowing that they're going to keep a lot of this stuff in place. Yeah. You'd rather go somewhere else where you're not going to have to just deal with it pretty in effect. You know, I don't think people have all the opportunities in the world. It's not like you can vote with your feet, you yeah. know, when you're in a, in a bad job market, which, you know, academia now is quite a bad job market. Um, I don't think it's something people generally do, I tend to do, like when you're offered a job somewhere to look at the Title IX policies, you know, I'm not sure that's happening. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, some of your other academic interests. Uh, what, what's <laughs> exciting you these days? We can move on from Title IX for a moment. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I think I'm still kind of figuring out this, you know, having gotten caught up in this in this situation. And, you know, here we are talking about policy issues. I'm not somebody who ever saw myself as a policy person. I mean, I'm very interested in writing and issues of style. And, and I've said that one of the things that happened to me in, in writing this um, first Chronicle essay was I have a lot of envy of writers like somebody like Philip Roth, who feels a lot of freedom on, on the page. And I, I wrote a book a number of years ago called Against Love, a Polemic, which is a sort of attack on, on monogamy and talking about the elephant in the room in long-term coupledom, which is the fact that sexual desire often doesn't persist as long as you know a long-term 30-year marriage does. So, um, and that was a book where I found myself feeling a lot of freedom on the page to, to like figure out all the metaphors about mm -hmm. uh, monogamy and, you know, as like a, a premature grave. And so, in fact, what interests me is that, like figuring out a level of freedom stylistically in the stuff that I write about. So policy discussions is not, does not really lend itself to, to that. You're and quite good at it. You may not love it, but I mean, you know what you're talking about. This obviously, at least in this case, it's very personal to you, so you know yeah. the ins and outs. I mean, it, you know, it's this has been an interesting experience for me uh, because I did feel like I was sort of called on to kind of step up and say things publicly that might be controversial and risk whatever sort of repercussions might come. But it did make me interested in issues about democracy you know, and the American tradition, and I've tried to learn more about stuff like due process and why it's important. So something about the the voice of American writing, you know, from people like Melville or Twain and Huckleberry Finn and, and the sort of freedom on the page that American writers have felt that I feel like I have borrowed from in, in my own work, um, there's some way that I think that has, my thinking about being a writer has changed somewhat by being, finding myself in this situation of being accused of things and having to take a public position about freedoms and rights. Yeah. That, that was a bit of a convoluted answer. No, 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 but I get it. I mean, it's interesting because as a, as a professor, you should have the ability and the freedom to not only teach what you want in your, in your class, but also to be writing about the things that you want. So really, you're, you're just asking for the, for the things that in some way you probably have already. Yeah, I went to art school and started out as a visual artist and then a video artist. So I'm not a traditional academic. And I just the other night had the chance to speak at my alma mater, San Francisco Art Institute, and realized how much being part of um, or being schooled in a kind of avant-garde tradition that did have to do with pushing back against social proprieties and, and aesthetic norms, like how, how much that's influenced my work. So even in writing about this wonky thing, Title IX, I find myself kind of wanting to take those liberties that are both part of this artistic tradition, but also like this American the freedom, you know, somebody like Walt Whitman, I mean, the, who's the most known for expressing a kind of sense of America as mm -hmm. a, a sense of personal possibility and liberty in terms of writing and voice, you know, to, so to incorporate all of those, um, that history and that tradition, uh, you know, in my work. So I know that sounds weird and, and highfalutin, no, it, but it's what's been on my mind after having gone through this whole thing. Yeah, so I've only got one more for you. That I think will be <laughs> oh. a, nice, a nice segue okay. off that, which is what would you say to the other professors, students, administrators, all of the people that, that see some of the nonsense that you've had to deal with that are just afraid to talk? I, I get so many emails yeah. from people, I'm afraid to post your Facebook clips, I'm afraid to say this, my brother won't talk to me anymore, all of that stuff. As someone that now is on the other side, uh, as so many of my guests have been. They've staked out some position, and they were afraid, probably lost some friends, didn't get support in ways that they wanted, but then made it to the other side. As someone that has done that, or at least is in the process of that, what's the best thing that you could say to those people? I think there's two levels of fear. You know, there's the fear of social, uh, you know, disapproval that happens on Twitter or, or, or social media, and that I would just, like, don't even think about that. But there are real material fears, like the fear of losing your job mm -hmm. and your health insurance and you know, possibly your house when you can't meet your mortgage payment. 
So I think what I tried to do in my own situation was to separate out the real fears from the those other fears, you know, the fear of people disapproving of what I would say. So I did try to think very seriously about was I likely to lose my job if I wrote about the Title IX process? And I decided that no, it wasn't a realistic fear. I did not think my university would fire me, and that turned out to be true. And, you know, could I live with being disapproved of on Twitter? Well, yes. <laughs> so I think that it's about not, you know, it's about avoiding paranoia and, you know, uh, and, and being realistic and taking realistic risks. So I do think that's what I did. I tried to kind of separate out what was um, uh, an acceptable level of risk and what wouldn't be an acceptable level of risk. If I didn't have tenure and would be likely to lose my job, maybe that would be not an acceptable level of risk. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I mean, this is what it's all about to me. People that are having an honest conversation that sometimes get thrust into a conversation without having wanted it in the first place, but then use it for something else. Mm -hmm. So I wish you luck on this adventure. Thanks. We should do this again and we'll I'd do it in, in uh, you know, maybe a year or so, or who knows what'll happen in the next year, but we should do it again and just sort of get an update on this and okay. see if some of this stuff actually, if some of the brush has been cleared and maybe people are thinking about this a little more. I would love to, Thanks. sensibly. Uh, all right, and you guys can find out more about Laura and her work and her books and all of that good stuff at laurakipnis.com.